For Creamer Media's Polity, I'm Chanel Debrain. Tashmir Ismail joins me in studio to discuss the new book, New Markets, New Mindsets, of which she is a co-author. Hi, Tashmir. Hi. You have recently published this new book. Does the book outline new ideas of how business should engage with poor communities in South Africa? Absolutely. Uh, it's exactly what the book does. We went out and found a group of companies. Uh, we did research on them. Uh, companies that we thought were doing interesting things, not all of them getting it right. Um, companies facing interesting challenges, legacy issues, um, or companies doing really groundbreaking work in the space. We then uh, focused on one company per chapter and really went into depth around how that firm was engaging with low-income communities, what were its strategies, how it was innovating, um, and what were the networks that it was engaging with to get these strategies right. Please could you discuss the evolution of large companies' engagement and their business in low-income low communities? Yes. So initially what we saw was businesses didn't take low-income markets very seriously. Uh, there was this um, assumption that people with no money could be made, no real business could be done with people on low incomes because there would be no margin. We start seeing a shift where businesses realize that if they want to grow, uh, their top lines. They need to move out of very stagnating developed markets where they're, where they're quite saturated. I mean, there's only so much more toothpaste and soap people are going to buy in the developed world. Um, and to grow that top line, they're going to need to move into underserved, underserviced markets. Now, this base of the economic pyramid, these low-income consumers, number over four billion. So it is the bulk of the population. And as firms move into dynamic or emerging markets where growth rates are higher, the big part of the population here are these low income earners. But the way business had to engage with them was very different from their traditional markets. And they had to reinvent their business models and innovate in very different ways. Because now you innovate for a person with low resource bases. So you need to think like someone with low resource. There's a lovely term for this called frugal engineering. And frugal engineering is uh, innovating with a frugal mindset. So businesses initially, their, their initial engagements were very much, well, we'll take what we do in our traditional markets and we'll just force feed it in here. And it just wasn't working because people have very different needs, different aspirations, and of course, uh, different incomes. And so firms then start rethinking the way they do this, but they're still doing it in their office blocks, in their air-conditioned Santon uh, office. And uh, again, these, are, these business models are not that successful because they're not really understanding the needs of the market. Then we start seeing pioneering firms going out into the market and immersing themselves in that context and really getting a much deeper understanding and engagement with these communities. And eventually, what we're starting to see is this model called co-creation. That's our new magic word, is that you co-create your, your business model or your idea with the people that you want to serve. Because that's how you're going to get the best understanding of a product that's going to be bought by them. If something doesn't meet uh, a real need or add real value in that person's life, there's no excess income to squander on uh, uh, things they don't need. So, so understanding real need uh, and adding real value only comes with a deep engagement and respect for a community. I think the other, the other important learning that we've seen come out of the research is previously it was a very much a them and us, which is in the book we actually talk about this in the final chapter where we pull our, our learnings together. And we've moved away from a them and us to understanding that them is us. We, we cohabitate uh, the same ecosystem. And to be successful and have a sustainable business, um, we really do need to see these communities as an extension of the business. The, the business impacts the ecosystem, and the ecosystem impacts the business. And you need to develop a flexible uh, a business model that is able to adjust itself as this feedback happens. It's, it's a continual, iterative process. You mentioned that income poor communities have important assets that are vital in building businesses, but yes. they often lack the financial resources. Yes. 
Can you tell us about these assets and how they can be used to create businesses and opportunities? So, I mean, part of what we do at the Gordon uh, Institute of Business is we do uh, immersions into low-income communities. And we've been doing quite a bit of work in Dipslut. And as part of my work, I visit a lot of these little, these micro businesses, these micro entrepreneurs. And I am amazed at the innovative business ideas um, and really cool things they've got going. Uh, I'll give you an example. There's a guy who has a business where he charges cell phones. So he's in the middle of the, of the street. He set up some scaffolding and he's, he must have at least 200 different cel cellular phone chargers hanging from his scaffolding. And then he's got this battery pack. And what he does is charges people's cell phones. They pick which one matches. Uh, he charges it for them, but that's not the end of his business. While you're waiting, while your phone's being charged, he also has an electric shaver, and he does haircuts for 20 rand while you're waiting. So, you know, this, th these very uh, nifty ideas, these uh, entrepreneurs um, have ideas that really fit into that market that meets the needs of people who live there, and they have this real understanding. And if businesses want to be successful, they can't come in with an arrogance. There needs to be a humility that people who live there every day understand what the needs are. And, and businesses that can learn from local entrepreneurs and local people and bring that learning into their business models um, are the ones that are most successful. Uh, because, you know, you're not, you're not coming in and superimposing your uh, f first world view uh, on a market where it just doesn't fit. Um, so in that sense, yes, these businesses ha do have uh, a lot of skill and um, exciting ideas that can be built upon. And this is why I mentioned earlier that this co-creation model is so important. But what, what we do find is lacking um, are management skills, business management skills. So a lot of the spaza stores you go into, you ask them to have a look at financial records because you want to help the guy expand his business, you want to get him some financing, but there's nothing. You know, records are kept on the back of, you know, cigarette packs or scraps of paper. Very often the business owners um, don't know what profit they've made that month, if at all, because a lot of them live off their shelves. And I think there's a, there's a huge amount which um, large business can do to transfer some of these management skills into these low-income communities and the businesses there. And there's a, there's a very big enterprise development opportunity here. Businesses do need to give 3.5%, I think it is, of profit after tax towards enterprise development initiatives. And if they can start including these micro businesses in their value chains, so it's, it's, you know, this money spent is not going into a black hole. You actually see value created from it because you are developing businesses which can form part of your value chain. And, and it's a win-win there because let's take, for example, Standard Bank. They're trying to work with um, small spaza stores to create mini or micro bank branches by giving these guys uh, pieces of equipment that can process certain transactions, basic transactions. Now, for Standard Bank, you can imagine what a bonus this is. They get this huge footprint of Spaza stores. They get a trust relationship that the store owner has with the local community. It's easier for the local community to access banking because it's someone they trust. They know the guy from school or he's married to their uh, cousin's uh, uh, sister or, you, you know, there's some sort of family um, link. And very importantly, they don't have to spend 20 rands in taxi fare to access a bank branch. It's all there. It's all very localized. So Standard Bank wins by getting this footprint and leveraging local relationships. And the Spaza store owner wins because they can now differentiate their service. They can offer financial services uh, in addition to their other offerings. It makes them more competitive. And just by working with a large company like Standard Bank, they get introduced to systems and processes that make their business more competitive and make them more competitive business people. And do you believe that business should play a role in poverty alleviation? And could you just elaborate on your standpoint? My personal standpoint is absolutely. I think that business has a very important role to play in, in poverty alleviation. Um, I think business, I, I think it's in business's interest to build robust microeconomies 
if you want to function in that, if you want to service that market. Uh, you want to create greater incomes in these communities because greater incomes in these communities means your business is going to thrive. So, uh, you know, simply coming in, selling and pulling profits out is, um, you know, is a very parasitic type relationship which actually destroys the economy. Um, but by working with communities uh, in, in, a, in a symbiotic relationship, um, uh, you really, you, you grow the market for yourself, simply put. You grow your own market. Now, what we have seen is that there's, I think, not a lot of trust in conventional development models because we've seen that they haven't had the impact that we'd hope they'd have. And it's, uh, you know, it's the old analogy, teach someone how to fish. And this is the, the type of business model, uh, the, the base of pyramid business models that we build uh, or talk about in the book New Markets, New Mindsets, is very much around how you engage um, with a community and you have a development impact. Now, not all firms see this, and there's a spectrum. So there are some firms that say, we are here to make money, um, and that is it we do not see any development role for our firm. There are firms who engage with these communities and they don't really have a development mindset, um, but it happens anyway, because the minute you give people access to goods and services, uh, you do change their lives and it does develop them. For example, uh, The Economist did a study and I think they said for every 100 people connected in a, in a mobile network in a typical developing country, you add something like 0.8% of GDP growth per person. And cellular phone companies were there to make money, but the development impact they have had on this continent is phenomenal, purely because it's given people access to communication tools and to information. So sometimes it happens by the way. But there are some firms, certain firms, that really do understand um, that their business survival is linked to developing and growing these economies. And they see a sustainable uh, um, future. They're not going to leave, they're going to be there for the next 100 years, and they need to build these communities that they want to operate in. And what is your opinion on the view that firms entering the base of the pyramid space are nothing more than unethical raptors that are seeking to profit by exploiting low-income communities? You know, we have seen this happen in the past. Um, there are firms that will want to profit above all else. But it's a dangerous game to play. What we find is uh, low-income communities, word of mouth is one of the most important marketing tools you can have. And if you do wrong, if you um, engage in unethical business practices, there's such a strong memory in communities, it is very difficult for your brand to recover. In addition to the word of mouth, we now have this uh, word of mouth on steroids with social networking. And I mean, one of the, the fastest growing um, uh, methods of communication in Africa is social networking sites of some kind or the other. And so this word of mouth spreads very, very quickly. And companies need to be so cognizant of the actions that they take because uh, uh, unethical practice is exposed very fast. Can you tell us why you wrote this book and what insights it offers uh, big businesses? So working at the business school, what we noticed is that firms entering these low-income markets find it exceptionally challenging. Um, we're asking them to design goods and services with lower margins, um, but at the same time, the costs of servicing this market can be quite high. The costs of distribution, I mean, a lot of these um, base of pyramid people are living in infrastructurally marginalized conditions. And distribution costs, uh, uh, getting your stuff there um, and getting it at that price point is hugely challenging. And what we felt is we could see examples of, of other firms struggling with the same issues. And we could see examples of, of other firms getting things right or, or elements of the business model right. I wouldn't say that any firm has everything down, um, but they were getting elements of the business model right. And we thought, well, this would be really useful for firms going into these markets to A, see that everyone else is battling with the same issues. Um, and secondly, learning. You know, we, we need to do a lot more sharing and collaboration uh, in terms of accessing these markets. Because for one firm to go it alone, the risk is high, the cost is high. 
Um, and if this can be shared with a group of partners, um, it makes it a lot easier because you lower the risk because you're sharing it. You're also sharing expertise. And, and this makes it a lot cheaper for the firm um, to enter these markets and, and, and a lot easier for them to make the decision to go for it. At the Gordon Institute, we're actually running a pilot project in Dipsluit. And it's going to be, well, I think it's the world, a world first, where we've got a group of large companies coming together and saying, OK, we are going to see if we can share um, inventory management systems, if we can share DC hubs, if we can share a lot of the, the elements that make it so costly to service this market. Um, there, there are, of course, non-competing uh, businesses, um, but this, this really seems to be the trick is collaboration. And I think the book is part of this collaboration philosophy where we wanted to put out there uh, what, what people are doing um, so everybody can learn from it. Because if this type of business model works, if an increasing number of firms uh, start thinking about their business models in a sustainable, economically sustainable way, where they want to engage with communities and grow these communities, you know, the combined effect uh, would be powerful from a development perspective. And so hopefully this book contributes to really building this idea of engaging with communities um, and having a development objective in mind. Thank you.